Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by Alex Effer. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods, and we will go all the way back to last week, man. I kind of look back and winter slash fall are kind of hitting all at once here, so definitely got a little bit cooler. The coaching is in full full swing, which is, it's still just like this weird time of everything, right? Because I've been having this really long off season, but normally this is kind of like a downtime for me. Like all the basketball guys are back in camp. If I'm going to have soccer people, they're still in season or they're still playing. So it's weird to be coaching right now. And it's kind of thrown my whole like ebb and flow off a little bit, but Hey, I'm not going to look like the gift horse in the mouth here. I'm enjoying having these guys around. They're doing really well. Lots of calls last week. I had not only the iFastU Q&A call, which if you're not on iFastU, you need to sign up. A little bit more on that here in a minute. Had a mentee call. Had a podcast day last Thursday where I had Steve Tajian from uh, the men's national team on. Awesome call with him. I think you're really going to enjoy that episode, just talking about the logistics of working, whether it's in a major soccer club, working for a national team, integrating those worlds, because when you're with the national team, you always got to kind of keep tabs on what's going on with your guys and, you know, are they going to be fit and healthy when they come into camp? So just a really interesting show there. Even if you're not into this space, I think the operations side and the logistics side would be interesting. And then had an awesome call as well with Pat Rigsby. Believe it or not, it'll only be the second time he's been on the show, but definitely uh, a really good chat about where fitness businesses are at in 2020, what the future looks like, not just 2020, but you know, in the next five to 10 years, the evolution that will be our industry. So really good podcast day on Thursday and excited to push those out. Saturday was Halloween. I mean, this may sound crazy because a lot of people came up to me in the gym today and said, oh, you know, how is Halloween? Do the kids get to do anything? And I don't know what it's like in other places, but it felt like eerily normal here. The neighborhood kind of came up with a game plan where everybody would put any candy that they wanted to have out in a dish down at the end of the driveway, you know, put it up, you know, either on the driveway or put it up on a table. But kids could kind of just kind of roam around and get what they wanted. Parents would say, you know, have one, two, three, whatever they wanted. But I mean, it felt like really normal. It was kind of nice. Like the kids had a blast. The weather was amazing, and obviously this time of year in Indiana, it's very dicey. The last couple of years have been either bitter cold. Last year was super rainy. I think within two houses, Cade's shoe had fallen off, and so he was just he had a, a soaked, wet foot. <laughs> he was just miserable last year. So I mean, they had such a blast. They came home with so much candy, most of which we're going to give away. But it was just nice to have for an evening a really nice normal day. And the kids, again, just had an absolute blast. So that was super fun. Signed Kindle up for indoor soccer. So my thought process here was, hey, number one, she's not really into basketball. So give her something to do over the winter, something to keep her active on top of the little AD classes that her and I are doing. But I also thought, I mean, when I played indoor, I loved it because it's super fast paced, a lot of action, a lot of touches, and you just have to think faster right? Like if you've ever played outdoor versus indoor soccer, there's really no out of bounds. The ball's always in motion. So I loved it. She had her first practice yesterday. It seemed like she really enjoyed it. So kind of excited to watch that. And I actually mean watch. Um, Normally I kind of always put myself out there, either I volunteer to coach or if, you know, they don't have enough coaches, then I'll volunteer. So kind of like wait back until they claim that they need more, but Luckily, they already had volunteers, so it was really nice. I got to sit in the stands. I got to kind of watch the whole game, but really focus on her, cheer her on, and that was a lot of fun. So excited for that. Kate starts basketball this weekend, so we'll see how that goes. That is a very long season. In the past, he's just done like skill camps and that sort of thing. This is a pretty big deal. I think this is like one practice and one game basically every week through the end of February. So he's got like four months of basketball. (laughs) So I'm really like crossing my fingers that he enjoys it and that it's a good experience for him. So all that going on. And then this week, still more coaching. I mean, I think my NBA guys are going to have three to four more weeks. So as crazy as it is, some of them just got back a month ago, like they got to ramp back up. So I got to get them ready. 
Uh, the draft is right around the corner. I think we're two and a half weeks out as of the date I'm recording. When you listen to this, we're going to be like a week and a half out from the draft and pretty excited. I'm going to go up to Minnesota, hang out with his, with Ty, Joey, the, the skills trainer, some of his close friends and family have a little draft party there. So very excited for him. That guy's just put in an incredible amount of work. And we were sitting there the other day, just kind of reminiscing about how much time we've spent together. And as of today's workout, since he got here in the end of April, we have done 112 training sessions together. Yes, that's correct. 112 training sessions. So just mind blowing to think about how much time and energy he's put into his body, the commitment that he's made to himself, and just really excited for this young man and excited that this is finally going to come to fruition. I mean, you could imagine like having the biggest test of your life and knowing that it's the biggest test of your life, but it just keeps getting pushed back and pushed back and there's like no resolution. And I feel like that's kind of where he's been at for <laughs> geez, the last three or four months now, honestly. So excited for him, excited for all this to kind of come together and then just excited to put these guys back out there and show what they can do. I feel like they've all prepared at a very high level. I feel like they're all going to be in a in a better physical space than they've ever been in the past. And uh, just really excited to watch them get out there and play basketball here soon. So, all right, my friend, I'm going to stop rambling now. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to jump into this awesome new show with my guy, Alex Effort. One thing Bill Hartman and I have talked about for years now is the power of mentorship. Early on, I didn't have a mentor to shape or guide me, or most importantly, help me find the blind spots in my own training and coaching. But luckily, after many years of trial and error, I found Bill, and my professional success exploded as a result. But the downside to the mentorship process, at least professionally, is that it can be pricey. For private mentees that I work with, it costs anywhere from $3.99 to $5.99 per month to work together. And while I know the results go far beyond that price, the fact of the matter is that just won't work for a lot of folks. So when Bill and I sat down a while back, we asked ourselves a really tough question. How can we help shape the future of the industry and truly make it great? And beyond that, how can we create amazing content yet make it affordable to virtually every trainer or coach out there? And the answer for us was simple. Restart iFast University. Here's what you'll get when you become a member of iFast University. One update each month from myself and Bill. This could cover anything from improving exercise technique to writing better programs and everything in between. Twice per month Q&As, where Bill and I will personally answer your questions to help you become better at training, coaching, or even running your fitness business. A Facebook group where you'll be surrounded by like-minded trainers and coaches who are serious about getting better, and access to the iFastU archives, where you'll be able to watch literally hundreds of pieces of content from the iFast team over the years. This blend of content and Q&A is specifically designed to help make you the best trainer or coach possible. If you're interested in learning more, head on over to ifastuniversity.com to get signed on. We'd love to have you on board. Alex Epper is the CEO and founder of Resilient Training and Rehabilitation Incorporated and Resilient Education. Alex has worked with, provided consultations, and presented for professional, semi-professional, and amateur athletes, executives, as well as those suffering from chronic diseases. Alex is sought after for his knowledge by fitness and rehabilitation professionals and has created the Evolve Mentorship to help other professionals develop a coherent, principles-based model to systematize their assessment and interventions. In this show, Alex and I talk about why he puts such a huge emphasis on both breathing and gait, the difference between quantitative and qualitative assessments, why your assessment process must be adaptable, and why he places such a big emphasis on exercise selection when designing programs. This was a really insightful show, and I think you're going to love it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Alex, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Super excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hey, Mike. Happy to have happy that you had me on here. Yeah, so I, I'm an exercise physiologist, strength conditioning coach out of Toronto, Canada. I work with clients online as well as in person. I mean, online now because of the <laughs> pandemic. But, yes. you know, during this time, I've really shifted to online. And we were kind of talking about this before that, you know, it was something that I wasn't really comfortable with 
posting online and, yeah. and just doing everything online. But just because it's just not what we've been taught to do, right? <laughs> we've been taught to be in front of people and, and work with people in person, kinesthetically cueing them if they need help and just totally transitioning online. And so, yeah, so that was a huge shift for me. But now I'm just doing a lot of education online, just talking about my assessment process, exercise selection, just how I view movement and some of my overarching principles that I use that really form the basis of how I select these exercises and why I select the assessments that I do. But I've worked in the collegiate setting. I've worked in neurological clinics, working with people with stroke, MS, Parkinson's, worked with professional athletes, and then worked with everything in between the business executives, chronic or persistent pain. And yeah, so it's just the combination of all those environments has really allowed me to be more adaptable when it comes to assessment, when it comes to selecting appropriate exercises rather than just saying, okay, we're going to select this exercise with no context, <laughs> just like, okay, everybody needs to squat. So let's just squat where it's, you know, when it comes to the people who are really far down the line, when it comes to chronic pain or persistent pain, it's really about manipulating the environment and the task to make it appropriate for them. But again, working with professional athletes or even semi-pro or amateur athletes, you're now able to say, okay, well, I can now understand where these people need to get to from a physiological, from a biomechanical, from a neurological perspective. So now I have the spectrum in terms of reverse engineering how to get there. So I, I think it. it's a little bit about a little bit about me and yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So tell me, let's go back a little bit. What led you to the world of physical preparation? Like, how did you get interested in all this in the first place? So, you know, as a lot of people, you know, I was an athlete in, you know, in Canada, hockey is the sport. So I played pretty competitive hockey. Luckily, my parents put me in every single sport possible. They're both accountants. So I decided, <laughs> you know what, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be behind a desk all my life. So I kind of went the exact opposite route. And I love sports, but obviously I wasn't good enough to do anything with it. And to be honest, my goal was always to get to the NHL. But, you know, I was I had injuries. I was in and out of physio clinics and, you know, we did some training. But back in the day, dry land training wasn't a big thing. It's like, OK, let's do some sprints. Let's do some burpees and let's get back on the ice. Right. right. It wasn't wasn't really held to a high standard, but. Really where I felt a shift in terms of me was, I'll never forget, we played in this hockey tournament where we were playing teams from Sweden, Russia, Denmark, and these they called these elite teams because what they did is they went to every single town and they picked all the best players and they put them in one team and then they would travel around the world and just play different teams. And a lot of times that was the feeder system to get into the NHL. But, you know, we as a team, we got there and we were just kind of doing some static stretching because that's what we've been told to do. That's what our coach who didn't have much knowledge in terms of physical preparation did. But you see these teams who are doing these elaborate warm ups, right? They're they're doing these dynamic movements. They're they're sprinting and they're getting the nervous system fired up. They're doing it in sequence. And I found that really, really cool. And I want to learn more about that. So you know, the combination between that and being in and out of physio clinics really made me want to kind of go into that realm, you know, and then reading stuff way back. This is, you know, reading T Nation, reading stuff, you know, that you would put out, that Eric Cressy would put out. Bill Hartman wasn't putting out that much stuff back then, but I knew him through just reaching out to, honestly, some of the people that were talking on your podcast, like Mike right. Roncarati. And just seeing where you could really go with this industry, because I had no idea where you could really go. I mean, I went to school and did kinesiology degree, and then I did like a postgraduate in exercise physiology. But again, they didn't really provide me with, what's, with much context on where you could kind of go. But as a young coach, I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I want to work with professional athletes and that's it. Right. <laughs> and, because I thought that everything else was boring and that was just me being naive, I guess. <laughs> yes. Because when you when you really gain more experience and work with a, a broad range of people, you realize that everybody's an athlete, right? Yeah. Everybody needs balance. They need some type of power. They need some type of strength just at different levels, right? Yeah. 
And so, yeah, so I just immersed myself, you know, into the clinics and doing the internships, um, which were super valuable and doing mentoring with, with people and which is to me was the most profound education because, you know, you really want to learn from somebody who's gone in the trenches and done the reps and who's coached people and knows the dynamics of not only just the art of coaching, which comes with the communication, with the cueing, but also the technical stuff like the biomechanics and principles of movement and how to integrate those. And to be honest, I actually wanted to be a, a physiotherapist, but I had admittedly some bad experiences, so to say, which, you know, when I was younger, I would do all these internships with clinics. And what I found was a lot of these physiotherapists were very myopic in their views points mm. in terms of how the body moves. And, you know, as somebody who was young in school, I couldn't question them. I just didn't know enough. But, you know, there was one scenario that I, I always mention and I'll never forget, whereas I was helping a, a physiotherapist and we had a professional baseball player and we had a 90 year old man, both tore their rotator cuff on the exact same program. And I was like, well, this, this can't be right. right. And based on this, I just, I kind of found it a little bit boring just because I didn't know it. I didn't understand it. Right. I didn't understand that it could be different. And so I kind of went the route where in Canada, if you're an exercise physiologist, you're allowed to work with pain, but also train apparently healthy people like general population and professional athletes and do the testing of the athletes like the VO2 max and, and, and the blood test markers like to determine lactic acid and, and stuff like that right? Or, or, or lactate thresholds. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to go this route because I really like the exercise component. I, I really like exercising myself. I like working out. And, you know, back then it was, you know, bodybuilding.com and, you know, all these things like more for the aesthetics. But again, you know, when you, when you train like that, you don't feel good. You feel stiff. You don't feel like you could move. So again, like I find, you know, people like yourself and Eric Cressy, you know, they kind of helped show me that there is a different way to train and it makes it more fun because now everybody is a puzzle piece that you have to reconfigure to try to understand how to meet their goals, the most effective and quickest way possible right so absolutely yeah i love it i love it so let's jump in here and i want to talk a little bit about like what your philosophy is because whenever i have somebody on here i think it's really helpful for the listeners as well as myself to get an idea of like what are your overarching big rocks or your philosophy when it comes <clears throat> to training a client or an athlete yeah so i think it it goes back to the fact that I've been exposed to, as I said, a lot of different environments and have immersed myself in every system that you can think of, PRI, DNS, FRC, just FMS, SFMA. <laughs> and, and the reason, and really the reason why I did all that was because, you know, you have to have this foundational knowledge before you can start, you know, going out of the industry, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. You know, at the beginning, I was really going into anything, any piece of information I could get my hands on so that I can try to formulate ideas as to why people would pick the exercises that they do and how they sequenced even just the training session. Or when you're working with a client and you're doing rehab, like how you organize that system. And so by going through all of those systems and learning from all these different people, what I really came down to, if we kind of go back to first principles, is what drives movement? And the reality is, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's survival, right? Mm -hmm. And the two things that your body needs to be able to do to survive is breathing and gait or movement. And, you know, so with that, inhalation and exhalation, both of those have two different movement patterns where every single, every single muscle joint, bone, fascia, everything is connected to produce those movements to get air, to get oxygen in the body. So when I inhale, I get this systemic external rotation. When I exhale, I get this systemic internal rotation. And then if we go into gait, you know, we have three different phases of gait. Two of them are external rotation. One of them is internal. So we have two shapes of the foot, right? We have pronation and we have supination. 
And so now you could say, okay, well, we have this inhalation. Great. We have two phases of gait supination that relate to that. And then we have pronation, which is exhalation, internal rotation. And then we can package those two and then start to go into concepts like, you know, that, that Bill Hartman really talks about, like expansion and compression, right? And then what I, you now can do is you say, well, now I have two strategies that the body uses in order to move and to breathe. Now I can manipulate those. I can now use my assessments to determine Am I in a phase of expansion or compression? What phase of breathing am I in? What phase of gait am I in? And then you just manipulate those by selecting an appropriate exercise. So now when you're looking at something like shoulder internal rotation, it's not just looking at is a certain muscle tight. It's looking at what is the shape of my rib cage? What is the shape of my pelvis? Am I in a state, again, of inhalation or exhalation and am i in a state of a certain part of gait right because right. you know we, we focus so much on muscles and muscles are just reactive i mean joints really drive the concentric or eccentric or the tightness and the lengthening of the muscles the, so basically the tissue quality but the nervous system tells the joint what to do and I remember way back when something that you said on a podcast, which was, you know, mo mobility is a joint position problem, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's not necessarily something that has to do with muscle tightness. Now, with that being said, you can have a neurological issue where you actually do have shortening or reduction in the sarcomeres, where now you have this fundamentally tight structure. But Tightness generally is just over neuro, like as a neurological overstimulation. And now what you have to do is you just have to say, okay, well, I'm going to put somebody in this position to reduce their tightness or their concentric orientation to drive more expansion, yeah. right? So that's when I invert somebody. So if I have somebody who can't expand be the space between their shoulder blades they're more biased towards internal rotation. They can't flex their shoulder past 90, right? So those are kind of like your power lifters and, <laughs> and people who are just super, super stiff. You know, that's, again, that's when you put them in a position like inversion or into like a squat position or a deep squat or one of those positions to drive more expansion. So really my main rocks are breathing and gait and how you can manipulate those into movement. But I think we have to go through a process in terms of understanding movement. And that is like, I always think of this pyramid of the base of the pyramid is talking about these dynamic systems theory type concepts, which is like, we have, you know, emergence and we have self-organization. Really self-organization is just your body is just going to organize itself no matter what the environment is, no matter what the task is in order to produce that task. So for example, let's say a baseball pitcher is, is pitching the ball and every time they hit the, the dirt mound, it changed like that they slide a little bit or their foot has to change to adjust to the changes in the dirt. But at the same time, if you as a bystander are looking or as an audience member looking, that pitch looks the same every single time. Yeah. But the body has to do with self-organize. And I kind of like have beef with like the lunge matrix for that same reason. It's like we don't have to tr train every single angle of a lunge. We just have to give the body the ability to lunge or give it context to lunge appropriately. And then it's going to translate into that type of movement pattern when the environment, like if they're in sport or whatever the environment is, it will just reconfigure to accomplish that task, right? So we have this dynamic systems theory approach where we have to look at how are we, what output or what behavior or what strategy do we see the body is presenting with and how can I manipulate an input, whether somebody's a manual therapist, they use manual therapy or that's an exercise or that's breathing or that's putting them upside down, right? How do we manipulate those concepts. And then we go into those first principles of movement, as I said, like the breathing and the gait. 
And then we go into global integration, which is when I'm looking at somebody squat or toe touch, how do they coordinate all these elements, whether it's their joints, their nervous system, tissue tension, sympathetic nervous system versus parasympathetic, how do they coordinate all these to produce a movement? And then you go into local where you're like, okay, well, if somebody has pain and you gotta, you have to look at the area that they feel pain just to make sure that there isn't some type of issue there that needs to be addressed as well. Or those are your passive ranges of motion where you're now looking at shoulder flexion, internal rotation, external rotation to try to gain context into understanding maybe what you saw when they were doing more like squatting in the toe touch. And then after all of that, you consider the cellular level, which is, am I getting sarcoplasmic hypertrophy? Am I getting all these different concepts? But like, if you just focus on the latter half, which is the cellular hypertrophy or the inflammation and the local integration. So really like, okay, we're looking at just this one joint. There's a shoulder issue. So it's just the shoulder. I think you're missing the boat in terms of getting effective results with clients. I mean, you may get results, but there's definitely a more effective way to understand why things are happening by going through that mental process rather than just picking on a muscle or picking on a joint and saying that's the issue because it really most of the time never is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one thing that you mentioned there, and I know you're passionate about, is the assessment process. And people mm-hmm. always want to ask whether it's you, whether it's Bill, myself, they love to talk about assessments. So would you mind just sharing, you don't have to go through the whole thing, but just mind, just give us a little bit of insight into what your assessment process looks like for somebody new that's walking into your gym. Yeah. So I will say that it's definitely evolved over the years. I mean, I remember I used to just assess everything. Like I had 70 assessment measures. So anytime I saw somebody, they'd be going like, it would take an hour to get through every measurement. But the reality was I just never, I wasn't using those assessments to guide what I was doing. Right. And so I had to take a step back and say, well, what am I really looking at, at this assessment process that is giving me any type of information? Because before I thought the more, the better. And the reality is, is, you know, I've narrowed it down to eight to 12 assessment measures that really provide me the information that I need. So I kind of follow that active versus passive type of assessment model. So anybody who comes in to see me, they, you know, we go through, again, that subjective analysis, just to understand like what their goals are and what they perceive to be true. I mean, if you have somebody who's in pain, you don't need to ask them where they feel pain because they are going to tell you, or they're just going to put their hand on it and say, yeah, my shoulder has been bothering me. And you're like, okay, it's your left shoulder, right? Yeah. Okay. But understanding what their perception is and what they want out of it, because then you can just guide your entire assessment towards kind of what they're saying. But then I move into the objective measurements. So I look at things like squat, toe touch. I look at seated thoracic rotation. And really what I'm doing is I'm not looking at, can they squat or can they touch their toes? But where are they? If they do touch your toes, how are they getting there? What strategy are they getting there? Can they do it without completely rounding their mid back? So for example, there's some people who just flop right over and you just see this huge hump in their mid thoracic spine, this kyphosis, if you want to say it. And to me, that just tells me that they got there by jamming their sternum down with the rectus strategy in order to, to touch their toes. Or they get there with a completely flat back. And so there was no change in their lumbar spine or, or, or thoracic spine. So really, you know, if I see all these flatness, I'm saying, well, this area is compressed. They're not able to flex here. They're not able to expand. They're not able to put air pressure through there or air volume, and they just have too much concentric activity of these tissues. So we have to do something to manipulate that. And the cool thing is, and and I'll talk more about the other ones, but the cool thing is, is the reason why I kind of like narrowed it down to these ones is I can, if I'm strapped for time, I can pick one of these and start making my decisions. And, and that's really the most important thing. Like you shouldn't have to be like, Oh, well, what is their internal? What is their external rotation? 
It's like, well, if you look at their squat, you should be able to, with some reasonable doubt, be able to kind of make a logical conclusion of what you might expect to see. Now, there's some people who it's very difficult to to identify those things, but that's why the other measurements come into play. Yeah. So I look at their toe touch to see their ability to flex, their ability to expand their back. Also, it provides me information about their pelvis. Like, do they have compression in the lower part of their pelvis? Do they have compression of the mid or the upper part? You know, when they touch their toes, if I see their their arms just internally rotate or their elbows pointing out sideways. I know that they've got some compression in their upper thorax that they're not able to get there. So they just round their shoulders essentially to get there. And that tells me that in a shoulder flexion, they're not going to get that end range. So I could start to kind of dive into those things. But those are really my two main standing measurements. Yeah. And let me just, you know, throw this out there that, you know, this would change if I was working with an athlete right? Where you have to look at performance measurements. This is just in my current context when I work with business executives and persistent pain and general population clients just to gain some insight into their movement. This would change if I change context, right? So yeah, so seat of thoracic rotation, I look at cervical rotation because what cervical rotation is going to allow me to see is, again, if I could turn my neck to that side, I know that I can flex my shoulder to that side. So it provides me information of what I'm going to see from a shoulder perspective. I look at hip flexion, shoulder flexion. I will look at internal and external rotation of the shoulder and hip, but you know, with the pandemic, I've really had to modify my assessment yep. to really be able to get that information without having to do it. And you know, one of the things that I've also been playing around with is, you know, when you get somebody to flex their hip or, or do a straight leg raise, which is another one, straight leg raise, a lot of times if they don't have the mobility, they are going to get there by cheating, by rolling on the floor. And they're like, oh my gosh, this person should not have 120 or 90 degrees of straight leg raise. Well, it's because they are rolling on the ground. And so what I've done is I've said, I've had to get people to push their foot into the wall and then perform it so that I can almost lock their pelvis into place into that extension, which essentially is what's happening when you flex the other leg, just lock in that extension just to really see what that range is. So the hip flexion, the shoulder flexion, straight leg raise, I use an Apley's, which is essentially like an Ober's test for, for your upper body. But the cool thing is, is you know, and, and Bill talks about this, but embryologically, there are certain parts of our body that get formed at the same time, right? Our thorax and our pelvis are very similar in terms of how they move. So if you look at hip flexion or you look at the Apley's, so if you look at hip flexion, you have an idea of what the same side shoulder flexion is going to tell you. If you do an Apley's, which is, again, as I said, like an Ober's test of the upper body, you can kind of gain some representation of what you might see of the obers on that same side. Yep. So let's say I do an Apley's test and if anybody doesn't want to know what that is, it's essentially I take my hand, my right hand, I try to grab my, or I try to touch my left shoulder blade. And you know what that's telling me is, can they extend their shoulder or extend their hip? And can they adduct? And then can they internally rotate, right? So those, those internal rotation measurements, because if we really break it down, external rotation is equal to flexion, abduction, and then the external rotation. And internal rotation is a combination of extension, adduction, and that internal rotation. So it provides you with the understanding that if I can touch my opposite shoulder blade without rolling my shoulder forward, I have the ability to expand my pump handle, my sternum, my manubrium. And then again, that tells me I'm going to be able to flex my shoulder overhead because the shoulder flexion requires some semblance of internal rotation to get there. So those are my main ones. And then if I look at, you know, I do look at posture, but I don't make my decisions based on posture. But one thing I've really been diving deeper into is the anatomy of the foot and how the foot shape dictates kind of what you expect to see at the pelvis and the thorax. So I'll take a look at somebody's feet from their toes to basically mid-thigh, front and back, 
And when I'm looking at their squat, I'm looking at from the back, from the side, sometimes look at the front, but I can usually get enough information from the back and the side. Yep. And those are really my main assessments right now that I look at. And if I'm in person with somebody, then sometimes I'll look at hip abduction and shoulder abduction and stuff like that, just because I'm just to gain more information because right. those abduction adduction tells me what kind of oblique orientation they may have. So yeah, it just provides me with more information so that again, the whole purpose of the assessment and to pick assessment measurements that you understand and can provide you value is because you should take those assessment measurements and the information that it provides you, be able to, the, the numbers that you see, be able to take those and be like, this is a representation of what I think the thorax looks like, the pelvis looks like, the foot looks like. And now I can be super strategic with the exercises that I select based on how I perceive the shape of the of these structures. I love it. I love it. So obviously assessments have been a buzzword for a while now, something that people have been really interested in, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people are doing a great job with it, right? So what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making when it comes to their assessment process? I think the first one is people assess because, you know, it's not necessarily the execution of the assessment, but people assess because they have to assess Mm -hmm. and they're just like, oh, you know, my, my facility or I think that I should be assessing people because that's just what I should do. That's what I've been told to do, but I don't understand it. So I'm just going to do it once and then forget about it. The second thing is going off from that is they do do an assessment, but they don't reassess. So it's like, okay, I've assessed you once. Great. Let's just get to it. (laughs) And they never reassess. So they don't really know if the exercises that they are selecting are actually doing what they are intended to do. Right. If I'm trying to improve the ability to internally rotate my left hip, well, how do I know that that's happening if or or how do I know that that's basically I don't want to say corrected, but let's say corrected itself through the exercise that I selected if I don't retest it. So that's another one. And then I would also say that people don't assess at all. And that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they don't under, maybe they don't understand it, or again, maybe they don't think it's valuable. They just have this preconceived knowledge that, you know, I understand the functional movements like horizontal pressing and vertical pressing and squatting and lunging. And I understand that these are the fundamental movement patterns, or these are functional movement patterns that everybody's going to do anyway. So why do I got to assess? Because I'm going to do them anyway. Right. Right. I think another one too, Mike, is you know, we were kind of talking about this before too, is people go to these courses, whether it's PRI or DNS or FRC or any of these other type of courses, and they get all this great information because they provide you so much great information and, you know, background explanations as to why they do what they do. And the body is so complex that of course, there's going to be so many different ways to skin the cat, so to say, right? So what they do is they go to these courses and they're so mind blown by it that they completely overhaul everything that they've (laughs) learned or that they are good at. And they just follow this algorithm that is presented and they may get some results for sure, but not everybody wants to be on their back and and, and doing breathing, right? You know, not everybody is going to fit this algorithm because an algorithm is just meant to make the thought process a little bit more digestible and easier to go through. So they follow this algorithm and then they meet somebody that just completely goes against everything that they've seen, right? Like this person isn't in their right side. They're actually in their left side. Right. Like what's going on here? Right. Like this shouldn't be happening. And so, first of all, they pigeonhole everybody into this preconceived notion as this is how everybody should present with. These people don't present this way. So they're like, well, I can't help you then because, you know, you don't fit within my mind frame of what I expect to see. And, and that's really what the big thing is, is your assessment needs to be adaptable and it needs to be assessment measures that aren't 
necessarily, I don't want to say standardized, but aren't, it's just reflective of what that person's movement capacity is. Like we should be looking at an assessment and being like, that's actually what they can do. I'm not cueing them to do anything. And even if I did cue them, they still wouldn't be able to do it. And those are the assessment measurements that we have to select is, is this measurement truly providing me with an accurate representation of what that person's movement capabilities actually are? And yeah, and then I think the last thing um, that comes to mind is, again, people, you know, they get confused on what they think is important to assess. So what I mean by that is, you know, they, they maybe don't have, they're, they're very new in terms of understanding of how the body moves and they just see an assessment, whether it's online or on Instagram or wherever, or somebody else doing it. And they're like, okay, I'm going to apply this to everybody because this person knows what they're doing. So it's got to be good. Right. Yeah. And I'm totally guilty of doing that early <laughs> on, but you know, I think, you know, really watching people and, and, testing it out, like what the people who have gone through the reps are doing, you know, it's definitely got to be right some way, but you got to figure out why they're doing it rather than just saying, okay, it's good. You know, they're doing it. Bill's doing it. Mike's doing it. Eric's doing it. So it's got to be good. So I'm just going to do it. You know, you really have to understand these fundamental movement principles in order to be able to understand what's going on in the assessment. For sure. Okay. So obviously assessments are an important piece of the puzzle. I think we both agree mm -hmm. on that. But I yep. think the most important thing to note is that we don't assess just to do an assessment. We assess mm -hmm. to ultimately write better programs. So mm -hmm. how do you take the information from your assessment to help you pick better exercises? So I think, um, you know, when it comes to, again, like the information that the assessments can provide is going to directly select the exercise. I mean, what I see a lot is, you know, if I get a client, they've seen four or five, six different people, whether it's therapists or other trainers, and they come to me with this laundry list of different exercises that they've been given. And they're like, Alex, like I do these exercises. It takes me an hour every day. Right. And they're like all these like low level exercises. And I was like, okay, let's just scrap these and let's try something new. And because what you should be able to do is you should be able to combine all of your assessment and they should be able to merge into a specific exercise. Yeah. Right. And that could be your reset exercise, if you want to call them that, or your corrective exercise. But I look at it as this is going to create my assessment process and this is going to modify my ex my like the strength training and the power aspect of their training, even their cardiovascular system. So, you know, if we take people and we can put them in different archetypes, you know, wide infrasternal angle and narrow infrasternal angle, as an example, you know, we can see that a wide, for example, they are more biased towards compression. They're more biased towards internal rotation, force absorption. And that's like, you know, that's pronating and and they're able to create a good enough amount of pressure that they're pretty good at high power outputs, force outputs. So they like lifting heavier weights, but aerobic exercises, they are not very good at. Right. And there are exceptions to everything. Don't get me like I'm I'm not talking absolutes here, but let's just say for the most part, let's say you have a wide, right? And you know, what I typically see with a wide is they squat to 90 and that's about it shoulder flexions to 90, maybe to 120. They can't turn their neck very well. Hip flexions, 90. Straight leg raises, you know, in the 50s, 60s. And when you take somebody like that, you're just like, okay, well, what do I have to do first? Well, I know that they're biased more towards this compressive strategy. So I need to start expanding them. But because I know the shape of their diaphragm is different than a narrow, I may, it may be better that I put them on their back or on their side compared to on all fours, right? Maybe, you know, so now you start to say, okay, well, I'm not going to do all fours because that puts more compression between my shoulder blades, which is this big misconception. Everybody thinks that, you know, all fours breathing or something like that is, you know, expanding between the shoulder blades and it's, it's not like it's expanding a part of the rib cage, right. but not, what, but not what we think it's expanding. Right. Right. And so 
Now I'm like, okay, well, I have to expand between the shoulder blades. They're pretty limited their movement. So let me put them on their back. Let me invert them, right? You know, let me, let me do reverse bear crawls instead of forward bear crawls. Let me get them to walk backwards because that brings them more into a heel strike position because I know they are good at pronation, right? I know they are good at that mid stance of gait. So I need to bring them more into that early phase of gait. I need to bring them into external rotation. So that's where, you know, you do squats with heel lift, you do front foot elevated split squats, you know, we're doing chops, we're doing you know, bicep curls and, you know, we're, we're cueing breathing maybe a little bit different in the push-ups compared to somebody who needs more compression between the shoulder blades. This is somebody that I probably wouldn't be giving the YTs and Ws to because all that does is compresses between the shoulder blades. And not to say that YTWs aren't good, like they are good, but we just have to understand why instead of just saying, okay, well, they're good for everybody. They get this EMG activity of the rotator cuff, so they must be good. It's like, well, no, you got to understand what that EMG activity is telling you. But what you could do now is you could say, well, based on these things, I need to categorize exercises in terms of, again, what phase of gait am I bringing them towards? Also, what phase of breathing? Am I bringing them to more expansion, this inhalation, or more of this compression exhalation? Do they need more internal rotation? Great. Well, maybe I might bias them into doing a box squat because that helps me restore this internal rotation that manipulates the pelvic floor to bias me into this internal rotation. Maybe I'm getting them to lift heavier loads, right? Because the heavier loads provide compression. One thing that I really have been playing around with is the difference between facing towards and facing away from the cable machine, right? If I'm facing towards the cable machine, that's going to provide me more of this external rotation expansion type of activity. Whereas if I'm facing away, that's going to give me more of this hinging. And when I say expansion, I just mean like squatting, I'm able to counter nutate my pelvis. Yep. If I'm facing away from the machine, that gives me more of this nutation type element to my pelvis and to my thorax, which then provides me with more internal rotation bias. And so I can really change how I manipulate these exercises, even like an offset, like a contralateral versus ipsilateral. I can really manipulate how I select these exercises based on the assessments in those ways. And, you know, it makes programming so much easier. Yeah. But Absolutely. but it also it also makes you question why people pick certain exercises <laughs> when you go on Instagram or something and you're just like, well, you know, I think their intent was correct, but the execution just wasn't totally there. But that's why. And and just by me saying this, I hope, you know, for the listeners that they realize that it's not just as cut and dry as, okay, we're going to squat everybody. It's like, well, when do you squat somebody with heels elevated? When do you add the box squat? When do you add goblet? Why do you do zercher? Why do you do toes elevated? Why might you want to start in more of a staggered stance squat compared to bilateral, right? Like we have to consider all of these elements. Do we use a band between the knees or around the knees? I'm sorry. Right. And that's, that, that's kind of come back a little bit. Um, it used to be like, oh, band around the knees. It's useless. It's like, well, I think there is, I don't think there is any exercise that is useless necessarily. It's just, it has to be implemented with the right intent. And it needs to be accomplishing what your assessment measurements are telling you. Absolutely. I understand this question is a little bit vague, but I'm going to put it out there anyway, because like you said, we can both get on Instagram, YouTube, whatever, and see a training video and be like, what is that person doing? Right? Like, what is their goal there? So my question to you is, how do you go about improving your exercise selection process? You know, and and I realize this is a moving target, right? Like, What you and I probably would classify as a good exercise as little as two or three years ago is probably vastly different now. So how do you go about that process of refining your exercise selection? I think there's I think there's a few ways. One is just continually learning about the body. And like I said, I've I've been really focusing my learning on the foot as of late. And that has really changed the way that I select exercises. Right. And it's funny because as I was mentioning 
before is you, you, you start to see certain similarities in the body, even just the way that they look from a structure standpoint and from a movement standpoint. So, you know, I'm looking at the shin and I've been talking to uh, a few of my friends in the industry and I've been, t- I've been looking at the shin as very analogous to the thorax in the fact that as you go through the gait cycle, right, when you land on the ground, when you hit the ground with a heel strike, your shin, you have this negative shin angle, the shin that is kind of behind your ankle, and you land with the supination and plantar flex position. As you move towards mid stance, your shin starts to move forward as well. So does your thorax. When you get into this late stance of gait or this toe off position, which toe off happens because you hit this max ability to pronate, so now your heel has to start lifting off. Your knees, your your knee and your shin start to go more towards your toes and over your toes. So now you have this positive shin angle and it's no different than the thorax. So now what you can do is you can say, well, you know, I want to bias this person more towards this pronation or internal rotation or these later phases of gait. So that's maybe when your rear foot elevated split squat comes into play because you are shifting the load forward onto this front leg. You know, I think research says like it's like what 80% on that front leg of load. You take 20% off the back or then 20% off on the back leg, Mm -hmm. but you shift that weight forward. And as you go down, your shin goes forward, your knee goes forward. As long as you keep the weight through your heel, you keep heel heavy, you're, you're moving more into that later phase of gait. So just by looking at the phases of gait and trying to look at exercises and see if they can manipulate those phases of gait has been one way that I do that and try to categorize these exercises more because I think I'm moving away from just like doing sagittal and then frontal and then transverse. And because I think what you can do once you start to really understand these principles is you're able to do a transverse plane activity looking thing to manipulate the frontal and the sagittal plane. Yeah. Because I don't think they they move in, in, in like independent of each other. They're very interdependent. It's no different than you saying, okay, well, we're going to do this aerobic activity. It's like, well, the reality is, is it is biased more towards this aerobic, but you know that there's anaerobic and alactic contributions that have to come into play, right? So yeah. that, that's, you know, that's another way, again, like just learning about the body. I think continually just failing <laughs> to be honest yep. you know working with a client and you know you see an assessment and you you do this exercise that you think is going to help and doesn't so now you got to get creative and you know i think with the pandemic too i've had to be even more creative because i don't have the resources at my disposal that i normally do right like i don't have the equipment you know sometimes i have clients who have no equipment so i was like okay well how can i use this book how can i use this pillow do they have a rolled up towel? Like, let's scan the room. Let's see what you have. And right. <laughs> let's change the exercise based on that. And then, you know, I think, I think those will be really the major two ways that I've been doing it. And then the last way is I've actually been going back into the previous programs that I've written, like really early on. Yep. And because I think it's like no different than, you know, like a child who, when they're younger, they, they're just curious. They always want to ask why and like why things happen, why things do this. And you're kind of going back and you're looking at it like, why did I make that decision back then? Because it could be right. And the other way that I think about it, it's like, it's like you going on Spotify or something and, and you listen to a song that you were listening to 10 years ago and you're like, oh yeah. That's amazing. It's no different than an exercise. You're like, oh, yeah, that exercise. I totally forgot. Right. And so I think those are really the three ways. It's just learning more about the body, going back into what I was learning before and just having to adapt to the current times. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Okay. One more final question here before we wrap up. And I want to talk a little bit Mm -hmm. about coaching. So obviously it's one thing to go through the assessment process. It's another thing to write a great program. But the final piece of this puzzle is actually being able to coach it well. You've obviously Mm -hmm. been doing this for a little while now. And both, as you alluded to, both offline in your gym and also now online. So Mm -hmm. what advice would you give to the young trainers and coaches who are listening in that want to get better results with their clients and athletes? I think 
the big things are, you know, and I was the same way, you know, with earlier on in my career, it was all about understanding the X's and O's of training and rehab and really understanding how the body works. And I still am doing that. And you, I don't think you ever, you never will, like you always will be. But I, one of the best things that I did was reach out to a few people, as I discussed earlier, you know, like Mike Ron Karate and just trying to talk to as many people as possible who were doing the things that I wanted to do. Yep. Just ask them questions and ask them how they did certain things and, and what they thought. The other thing was is I read a lot of books on communication, just to learn how to talk to people. I think a lot of people don't understand how to communicate things in a certain way because, you know, when you do an assessment, you do an exercise program, how do you create buy-in? Because the reality is that our clients do not care <laughs> or a lot of them do not care about how the body moves. They just like, just get me there. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. You know, if we're lucky, <laughs> some yeah. of them might not be as compliant. But you have to explain in a coherent way why you're doing what you're doing. It's like even through the entire assessment process, I'm explaining why I'm looking at something. But I'm not saying, oh, yeah, so I'm looking at this internal rotation because I'm going to see if you're expand or compressed. Don't tell clients that they're compressed, first of all. Right. Right. But what I do is I'm, is I'm explaining to them, hey, do you remember how you were saying like in tennis you have a hard time in that, you know, in your backswing or your forehand, this is why. Like, this could be a reason why. I mean, I don't know for sure, but you know, it's a high degree of probability that if they don't have this type of movement, that they may not be able to access that movement when they're playing the sport. And so, what you can do is you just relate it back to what they are saying. In every assessment that I do, I ask them if they enjoy reading and what book they are reading or what podcast they are listening to. Because then what I will do is I will read that book or I will listen to it or I will look up the book or whatever they talk about, even if it's a TV show or something. I will do a little bit of that. And the next time I see them, I'm talking about it with them. Because what you're doing is you're now relating to them. Mm -hmm. Because what they want to like, you know, in, in the book Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene, he talks about two ways in which human behavior is influenced. One is self-preservation, and that is like their sense of what they know, right? Is this going to hurt me? The second is acknowledgement. They want to be acknowledged. They want to be understood. They want to be heard. They, only, they, they want to be the only people in the world at this moment in time. Yep. They don't want to be compared to other people. They're like, you know, I'm Alex. I just want to hear about Alex or like, you know what I mean? So right. to relate things back to them, make it meaningful to them. And the way you make it meaningful to them is to listen to them. And the last thing is just get experience, right? Like just as you start to work with more people, you're able to understand how to communicate properly and, you know, explain the process to these clients, right? I mean. You know, one thing that I see that a lot of young coaches do that or even like rehab professionals do early on is they don't give them a plan of action. They, they're like, OK, like I see this, this, this from the assessment. Great. They don't say, OK, so from what I see, like we're going to try these exercises. We're going to see what we can do from this. We're going to like let's try to get in here two times a week or one time a week, whatever you can do. Let's try to front load this. Because I want to make changes as quickly as possible because movement is a behavior, right? And so what we need to do is we need to change that habit to make it more – to make these parts of your movement more efficient. And when I talk like that, it's because they've said to me, hey, like I want to improve this from a movement standpoint or from a fitness standpoint or from a pain standpoint. So I just say, hey, like this is the plan of action. And then in a few weeks, we can reevaluate. So now what you've done is you've given them total control and total autonomy that it doesn't feel like you are the one who's in control. You are just the guide into their journey, so yeah. to say. They're yeah. the hero of their story. You're the Yoda. Yeah, right? I love it. I love it. That's yeah. uh, story brand, right? It's all exactly. That's what it is. I love story it. Brand. I love that yeah. book. Okay. Yeah. Big totally. question. Big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young Alex Effer one piece of advice about training in or life, what would it be? 
Ooh, that's that's a that's a tough question. Something I've been thinking about <laughs> for a while, but I think one thing that I would change is again is focusing more on learning about other industries and and how because all systems are connected, right? If you read, you know, business books, you're going to understand how how movement system works and how just because the fact that everything follows within the same kind of principles and just learn about more psychology and communication because this stuff is all cool and we love to geek out nerd out to this stuff but the the, the movement standpoint but you know we need to be un- understand how to form relationships more effectively and how to communicate more effectively so that we can you know create buy in and create change that these clients wouldn't do or wouldn't be able to get and the other thing is you know put yourself in more uncomfortable situations. I mean, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, I uh, I didn't like posting anything online or social media, partly because I didn't know if I was going to be judged, you know, from people that I respect from it, but it doesn't matter. Just put yourself out there. You're trying to progress the industry forward. And as long as you're doing that and not bashing people, you know, you're good to go. You're part of the solution, not the problem. Absolutely. I love it, man. Yeah. All right, my guy, last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answers can be as long or short as you like. All right. Number one, what's your career highlight so far as a coach or clinician? My career highlight so far is, you know, I I find a lot of, when I when I work with a lot of clients that have persistent pain, I can remember one, I know one in particular that I still currently work with. I mean, he's become a, a really good friend of mine, but this client came to me and he had low back pain and he was about to go get surgery on his back. He's about to fly to Germany to get this oh, wow. experimental surgery because he had no, he has no discs in his L2 to L5. And, you know, he loves playing golf, loves playing hockey and pretty successful businessman. But because of the pain, just everything just mentally is just kind of was closing in on him. And he walked in, essentially hunched over, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to fly out to Arizona to play this golf tournament on Friday, and it was a Monday. And he's like, I don't know how much we're going to get, and uh, because of that, I'm just going to book half an hour with you because I really don't know how much you're going to change me. And luckily enough, like we got some great changes really early on. He was able to play in that golf tournament, and you know we've had some hiccups here and there, but you know, he texted me and this is two years later and he's had no back pain this entire pandemic when he's been required to sit down more and not be able to play golf as much. So for me, just helping somebody like that has been like a huge, a huge impact on my career, I think. Yeah. Those those types of success stories are huge, man. Getting somebody out of pain like that. That's cool. Yeah. And they are. And you know, they are the reasons why you keep on going, especially when you get frustrated. I know like there are certain parts of this industry that just really, you know, fluster you a little bit. Yes. <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? But when you when you get that, you're just like, okay, well, I'm doing the right thing. This is what I'm meant to do because of this is how I feel. Like I love to do this. So let's continue. And that's why I learn more because the more I learn, just the more I'm able to integrate into my system so that I can help more people. And when I find somebody who stumps me, so to say, in terms of their movement. You know, that's just another reason why I just got to continue to learn more and just get better. Yeah, I love it, man. Okay, number two, we both attended Bill Hartman's The Intensive Eight, also known as Mm -hmm. Day Ocho, little dodgeball reference there together. (laughs) What was your biggest takeaway from that weekend? You know, there are so many big takeaways. I just remember going into each one of those days and at night after the dinners, I would go back to the hotel room and just study because a lot of things were just so mind blowing to me because the reality was, is there was a lot of things that I had put together in my head and I was maybe already doing, but I just had a different understanding of why things occur. I mean, one, I think one of the biggest things was how the internal organs can influence movement And just explaining again more why things are happening that I didn't have an answer to. I was just like, well, I know they happen, but I don't understand why. Right. And his ability to integrate all these different practices, sort of say, like osteopathy and physiotherapy and strength conditioning, just be able to combine them into 
one cohesive unit is just incredible. And the other thing too was, you know, just, you know, he's just, he's just a great person. He's a very nice person. Like that's, uh, and you know, you, when you meet somebody that you see online and stuff like that, you're just like, Oh my gosh, first kind of famous, right? (laughs) But it's just like, he's just a humble person. And we had such a great group. I mean, yourself, Mike Mullen, Ryan Patrick, you know, we had such a great group of people there that, that made it such a amazing experience. So just, just meeting the people was also a, a massive, massive thing that I enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. Once this is over, I can't wait until he can host those again. Cause yeah. I, I said it before on the show, like uh, of all the con ed seminars I've done over the years, it was the most impactful and it's not even close. So very, very cool. Okay. Number three. That's, that's- Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Number three, what's your favorite thing about Canada? (laughs) It's funny because, you know, we mentioned the intensive and, you know, what I always do is that whenever I go to the airport, there's this maple syrup um, store that they make everything maple syrup. So I always buy a couple maple syrups just to like bring to people. Right. (laughs) My favorite thing about Canada, you know, my fiance and I, we just went for a drive. We flew to Calgary, which is if anybody knows Canada, Canada is massive. And so to fly to Calgary, it's about a four hour flight. And we drove from Calgary to Vancouver, which was about 2,500 kilometers through the mountains of Banff, Vancouver, just the West coast. And just the beauty of the mountains is just, it's my favorite part of Canada is just the wilderness. And yeah. because we have so much land, we have so much greenery. It, it's not very hard to find patches of forest around here. Like we don't have to go very far. And, and yeah, I think that's my favorite part of Canada is just being able to access all these natural resources and these natural parts of the city where you can just escape and just unplug. Yeah. Right. For sure. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, number four, what's next for Alex Epper? What are you doing? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? Yeah. So right now, I've, I've just started my third cohort of my Evolve mentorship, which is basically just putting together my entire model in terms of you know the exercise selection, going more like going deeper into my principles, into my assessment, into why I'm doing the things I'm doing, and I've added another couple of weeks to even talk about communication and and kind of what we we're talking about and how coaches can communicate with their clients more effectively because our assessment from a business standpoint is our leveraging. It, it's our, it's our elevator pitch, so yeah. to say. And and that's, what's creating buy-in is, is that result or is the results and is the, is just the process in general. So I'm doing that and then just going to probably come out with more courses. I mean, I'm going to probably do a course on, on the foot just to talk about gait more specifically and how the foot we can look at the foot to understand what's going on in different parts of the body. But yeah, going to be continuing to host those mentorships because no different than the intensive. Like I just love interacting with the people and the power of online and social media is that you're able to meet people from all over the world. And so the mentorships definitely I'm going to be continuing to do and just putting out more courses and hopefully doing more stuff like this because I love, I love talking shop and and, and doing podcasts and stuff like this. That's awesome, man. Well, Alex, yeah. it's been it's been really great catching up with you today. Love learning more about your philosophy. Obviously, we got to hang out, but yeah. busy weekend. We didn't get to hang out quite this much, so it's been great to catch up here today. Where can my mm-hmm. listeners find out more about you and all the great stuff that you're doing? Yeah, Mike, I really appreciate you for having me. So you can find me on my website at www.resilientedu.com. You can also find me on Instagram at, at alex.effer. And that's really where, you, and then my email is alex.resilientedu at gmail.com. You guys can find me there, you know, and I'll respond in a timely manner, I promise. And yeah, <laughs> because I know, I know a lot of times we reach out to people, we don't hear back, but I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty timely when it comes to that. <laughs> you're, you're a better man than I. My daughter was sitting with me like two weeks ago and she's like, daddy, is that email from July? I was like, uh <laughs> Yes. She's like, you better respond. So she shamed me into responding to three emails that I've been having in my inbox since July. But regardless, Alex, man, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate you for having me.
All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with Alex. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. Definitely enjoyed this one myself. I think Alex is a very insightful guy. I think we follow a lot of the same mantras, specifically that when it comes to writing programs and especially when it comes to exercise selection, there's got to be some thought process put behind it. There's got to be some rationale behind it because too often it's just something that somebody finds catchy on the internet or they see it on the Instagram and they want to try it out. Look, there may be a time and a place for that, (laughs) but generally you want to try things out on yourself first before you try it out on your clients or athletes. So if you enjoyed this show, I've got one or two favors to ask. Number one, if you are not already, please subscribe to the podcast. That way you'll know each and every week when a new show drops. All you got to do, go to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, or even the Amazon store. Now, wherever you consume podcasts, we are there. Now, if you've already subscribed, thank you. Do me one, one level up. Go to the iTunes store, give us a rating and a review because ratings and reviews are the most surefire way to make sure new people, young trainers, young coaches, young fitness and rehab professionals get exposed to all of the amazing people that we have on the show each and every week. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.